Oh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name's Lachlan Blackall, and it's a pleasure to uh, welcome you to the Battery Storage and Grid Integration Program uh, seminar series today. Um, before um, we begin, please allow me to um, acknowledge the traditional custodians uh, of the land on which we meet today, which uh, for many of us is the Ngunnawal and Nambri people, and to pay my respects to their elders past and present. So it's a great pleasure today to be able to welcome Felicity Stenning, who's the CEO of Anova Community Energy, um, to present to us um, on their work. And obviously very topical given what's going on um, in federal politics at the moment and some of the recent announcements. Um, before we jump into uh, Felicity's presentation, just a little bit of um, housekeeping. So obviously um, we welcome um, to the audience today and it uh, consists of uh, members of the battery storage and grid integration program um, here at the Australian National University, um, as well as our colleagues, um, and researchers and students um, across campus, and also welcome any other guests um, who are joining us today. So today's presentation um, will be roughly um, 30 minutes, and at the end of the presentation, we'll be moving in um, to Q&A session. Uh, for those of you who wish to ask questions, and I know there's usually many, um, you'll be able to ask the questions by either raising your hand um, or asking um, questions into the, uh, into the chat box, um, which is enabled today. Um, so you'll have plenty of time through Felicity's talk to actually have a think about the curly questions um, you'd like to ask her. Um, so with that, I will, um, I will turn my video off and hand over to you, Felicity, um, to give yourself a bit of an introduction and then to dive into your presentation. And um, yeah, thank you from all of us for joining us today. Thanks very much, Lachlan, and great to be here with you all in this Zoom forum to talk about ANOVA's battery project. Um, I have worked in the energy industry for about the last 27 years. I'm an environmental scientist um, through my studies, and I've worked in renewable energy and um, certificate providers, retailers, and I'm really proud to be leading Innova Community Energy and Innova is a social enterprise set up to do good in the community. So we've established around five years ago uh, with an energy retail arm of our business and also a not-for-profit arm. And we send 50% of our profits from our energy retailer into our not-for-profit arm for community renewable energy projects, energy efficiency and energy coaching. We established as a social enterprise as a result of a lot of the anti coal seam gas um, movement in the northern rivers of New South Wales, which is near where our office is based in Byron Bay. And about six or seven years ago, there was a lot of uh, industry and government uh, moves to look at coal seam gas mining in the local area. And the locals and um, green, green community members farmers and other community minded people came together to really protest against um, the coal seam gas mining and really, as I like to call it, to protect our land and water resources. So we're very fortunate at the moment that in the Northern Rivers there is no coal seam gas mining. The lock the movement, sorry, the lock the gate movement was very successful in ensuring that our land and water resources were protected. Um, I know everyone has different views on coal seam gas mining, so I won't, uh, won't Go, go into that any further other than to say that uh, a lot of the passionate locals that did come together recognised, well, if we've said no to coal seam gas, what are we actually saying yes to? And so they said yes to a community owned energy retailer and that's how ANOVA was formed. So community owned means that 1600 individual shareholders actually own ANOVA. Um, we're not owned by one or two um, multinationals or individual organisations. It's all um, individual mums and dads and um, people who have invested into the business. 1,100 initially and then through another capital raise, another 500 also came on board. So our, our remit really is to create resilient and sustainable communities and ensure that in the transition to renewable energy, we're not leaving anyone behind. So we recognise that there's a lot of um, people that can afford solar and batteries and um, electric vehicles, but there's also a lot of the market that is just not able to afford um, these new technologies. And so we look at ways like 
microgrids and solar gardens and community batteries and different ways that we can bring uh, resilience into communities and bring renewables to people who otherwise wouldn't be able to afford it or access it. So our, our Beehive project is a community battery project where we're really looking to, to build that resilience into a local area, in this particular case in Curry Curry near Newcastle. We see that the solutions on the renewable energy and storage side are really about grid scale uh, solutions in terms of large solar and wind farms, um, hydrogen solutions, battery storage, um, bioenergy, biogas. Uh, as well as um, neighbourhood and street scale solutions and also household and business solutions. So we see that that makeup of, of the, the grid scale, the neighbourhood and street scale and the local scale has been really important to build resilience in to metropolitan areas as well as regional areas. Our battery project is, is quite unique and we're looking to put a 1.2 um, megawatt battery on the ground. It's about a two megawatt hour battery and it's about the size of a shipping container. It will enable us to store a lot of the energy theoretically from our customers rooftops into the battery and then uh, discharge that energy back into the market at times when the price of energy is higher than during the daytime. Uh, we will also, and I'll come into that in a bit more detail as we move through uh, the presentation today. The other part of the project is really to test and trial peer-to-peer -peer trading. So we're looking to bring on uh, 250 uh, customers with solar and 250 without into our Beehive project and test and pilot Innoces peer-to-peer trading platform called Power Tracer. So we're looking to pass back benefits from the battery and from the peer-to-peer -peer trading to consumers so that not only can people buy cheaper power through the peer-to-peer -peer trading, but people who are selling their solar power can realise something um, of a higher benefit than a current feed-in tariff um, arrangement that they might have with their retailer or with, with Anova at the moment. So peer-to-peer -peer trading we see is a really important um, part to test. We have around 50% of our customer base with rooftop solar already, meaning that about 50% of the energy we buy from our customers and uh, sell to our customers is coming from our own customers' rooftops. So we're quite unique as an energy retailer in that sense. Um, we've called it the Beehive. Our, our marketing team came up with this great um, way to describe the project. The Queen Bee is our battery, the shipping container sized um, two megawatt hour battery that will be located on Osgrid's land in Curry Curry. And then the, the worker bees, I guess, are the peer-to-peer -peer trading um, uh, participants that will share and trade solar energy. One of the reasons that the battery is going to be tested and trialled by us is because of our portfolio. So the battery actually has um, funding from the New South Wales Government through the Department of Planning, Industry and Environment to the tune of $998,000 and we're in the process of securing some federal funding as well to support the project. It, um, it's not um, economic to, to bring these projects to life. Um, currently there's a lot of market levers and market conditions that make it quite difficult um, as some of the, the ANU battery team may have found uh, in putting community sized batteries on the ground particularly when, when we are looking at this type of battery to deliver savings back to our customers. So of course we'd like to realise the benefits from the battery um, for Innova, but we aim to pass most of those benefits back through to our customers to provide cheaper pricing. So for Innova, what we're looking to do is, um, as I mentioned, with 50% of our customers uh, having rooftop solar, we have a, a big issue during the middle of the day where we become a net generator ourselves um, of energy. And that duck curve that many of you may know um, becomes quite significant for us. So we're looking to charge the battery um, during that middle of the day time using that excess solar and then discharge it in times of evening peak so that it can be available to the market then. And we'll look to recognise revenues through the FCAS markets, the Frequency Control and Ancillary Services market, 
um, in the national electricity market, as well as for us, it having the potential to reduce our hedging position. So as an energy retailer, the price of energy can spike in any 30 minute interval to um, above $14,000. And um, we put things like hedges or different financial instruments in place as insurance products to protect us from those market spikes. Um, we don't have protection for 100% of our load, but we do put that protection in place, that insurance um, in particular times where we know that there are likely to be um, spiky times in the market, particularly over summer. So we see the battery as a, as a really critical way for a small retailer like us with the amount of solar that we have in our portfolio to really help us reduce those insurance costs or those hedging um, costs and enable us to store that battery and sell it back into the market at times when it makes sense to do that. The, the duck, this is just an illustrative picture of the duck curve and it's really just showing that that um, duck curve situation is due to get worse. Um, obviously this is a 2020 forecast, um, but it's been getting worse every year and we're seeing obviously more um, solar penetration. I think I read a statistic the other day that I think there's a solar panel installed every eight minutes. So there's a lot of solar still coming into the market, which we think is a great thing. Um, but obviously it causes some challenges for us as a retailer and some challenges in the market as, as some of you may have seen um, more recently with the AEMC's draft determination. For the customer, we see the battery as a really critical piece in terms of enabling us to realise um, benefits through the battery that, as I mentioned, will pass back to, to our customers in terms of lower energy pricing and also through the ability for our customers to test and trial peer-to-peer -peer trading. We haven't seen a lot of take up on the Eastern Seaboard, particularly of peer-to-peer -peer trading. There are organisations such as uh, LO3 that was in the market and Power Ledger that's in the market mostly in Western Australia um, and Anosi that's been in the market on, um, on the Eastern Seaboard side based in Sydney. And we've partnered with Anosi to, to test and trial their Power Tracer platform so that we can um, pass benefits through the peer-to-peer -peer trading um, using some of the stored energy back into um, customers with and without solar. So the battery itself can also be a node participating in the peer-to-peer -peer trading platform and we can also use some of that stored energy from the battery to offer uh, low-income households or community groups access to very, very cheap power or free energy as well. Um, which we would like to, to enable through this project. We also know that there is a decreasing trend in terms of uh, feed-in tariffs that retailers are paying, including Inova. We have a 12 cent retail, uh, sorry, 12 cent feed-in tariff in New South Wales currently. So we know that there's likely to be declining feed-in tariffs. So we're looking at other ways that people can access renewables and we see peer-to-peer -peer trading as, as one of those ways. In terms of the DNSP or the distributor, the network who provides the electricity through the poles and wires to households and businesses, there's, there's some great benefits for them as well through this project. And as I mentioned, we're working with Osgrid. I should also mention we're working with the University of Newcastle. They are our knowledge sharing partner for this project. So one of the key parts in our remit under the New South Wales uh, Department of Planning, Industry and Environment's um, funding through the New South Wales Regional Community Energy Fund is to, is to put information into the market in terms of the, the learnings and, and knowledge gained through this project, which is really testing, is a small community battery able to deliver positive benefits to ANOVA and to our customers? And so in, in our project formation, we um, recognise that there could also be benefits to the network. And we are working with Osgrid. The battery will actually be situated on Osgrid's land near Curry Curry, near Newcastle. And through, through an operating protocol, we will provide Osgrid with access to the stored energy in our battery at times of peak demand. So they might make, say, 10 calls on our battery 
and however much uh, energy we have stored, it might be at 90% capacity, it might be at 75% um, capacity, we will provide them access to, to that stored energy to help alleviate uh, network constraints on the grid. And the other side of that, of course, is that we'll put a network services agreement in place with Ausgrid to realise some payments um, for that, which again, we can pass back uh, to our customers in terms of cheaper pricing across our customer base of 10,000. Um, I haven't mentioned yet, we've got around 10,000 customers. So we are, we are a small and growing energy retailer. We operate all through New South Wales. So for some of you familiar with um, the three networks of New South Wales, Osgrid Endeavour and Essential Energy. We operate all through New South Wales and we've just launched into South East Queensland, into the Energex network in South East Queensland. And we provide um, affordable electricity to households and businesses and also um, the industrial sector as well. In terms of delivering a project of, of this nature, um, there's a lot of work involved, uh, as the ANU battery team will know, in terms of putting large assets on the ground. Um, there is a lot of um, regulation and um, areas to, to move through to actually approvals to, to get projects like this on the ground. So we have been working with Osgrid on the installation and commissioning side, particularly around the connection agreement and the network services agreement and also the licensing or leasing agreement for situating the battery on their land. And we've also been working with a consultant and um, Cessnock Council through the development consent process there to ensure that there's no impacts to flora and fauna and the the truck coming in to deliver the battery isn't going to harm any of the roads or, um, or impact um, anyone and obviously that there's no noise issues um, coming from the battery itself once it's in operation as well. They're just some of the, the parts of the development consent process. Um, we also ran a tendering process to choose our battery and we've selected a Tesla Mega Pack. Um, that will be our product that is, is on the ground. And so that was a fairly lengthy battery tendering process. And we've recently just completed our engineering procurement and construct uh, tender process where we're uh, looking to engage a company to install the battery and commission the battery. So there, as I mentioned, there is uh, a lot of, uh, of market conditions and market uh, approvals that need to be gained to, to put um, a battery of this nature on the ground. Um, there's also the operating costs and benefits to, to obviously be considering. There's ongoing maintenance of the battery. There's software selection and software integration with a software provider to, um, to integrate with the energy market and to um, work through the FCAS markets and realised benefits in the FCAS markets as well as spot arbitrage which is the area I mentioned where we'll be selling the energy back into the grid at peak evening times. There's also of course the, the benefits that I've mentioned in terms of network support through Ausgrid um, for them being able to access that stored energy in the battery at peak times and um, realising some, some revenue benefits through the FCAS markets, those frequency control and ancillary services markets, and also that reduction in the wholesale energy costs for us and, and hedging costs or that energy market insurance that we, um, that we have in place over those particularly spiky periods. As I mentioned, um, University of Newcastle is our knowledge sharing partner and, and I do see that as a really critical um, part to, to deliver at the learnings from this project. It's, it's not an easy project, we're about three years in now. Um, there was around two years in terms of securing funding through the federal organisation and New South Wales government and there's been about 18 months um, through that time as well of project management to uh, move through the approvals and um, conditions required, as well as that battery tender process to secure the Tesla battery and the EPC tendering process. So um, it takes a lot of fortitude to put projects like this on the ground, particularly when there are not 
a lot of other community energy batteries on the ground. And it's one of the challenges that we've had as a very small retailer where we don't have deep pockets, that there are a lot of um, costs that we planned and mapped out and forecast, but there's also been quite a number that we just didn't forecast. Um, and that is often the case in, in getting new innovative projects off the ground. There's often um, other costs or things might take longer than, um, than planned. So it's been a very interesting journey over the last uh, three years um, in terms of looking to get this project on the ground. We are aiming to have the battery on the ground in September and um, we really see this as a way we, we really support uh, photovoltaic, uh, solar PV, being on rooftops, um, having solar farms as well. And we see batteries obviously as an, as an integral way to, to soak up that excess energy and store it and release it at times that it can be used um, that are more opportune for the grid and potentially customers as well. Uh, we also see projects like this as really building resilience into particularly regional areas but also metro areas. Uh, we'd love to see community batteries on the end of every street um, as the distributed uh, energy resources um, part of the energy solution in terms of transitioning to renewables and storage evolves. And the distributed energy resources obviously include rooftop solar and other smart technology in homes and businesses. And our, our vision is really around interconnected uh, ecosystems of distributed renewable energy um, solutions that connect and interplay with grid scale and community scale um, solutions as well. So ultimately we'd like to be delivering that resilience and cheaper pricing, um, more reliable energy into, um, into communities in metro and regional areas. So they were, I think I've um, exceeded my 30 minute time frame, Lachlan, <laughs> and um, happy to, to take questions and, and discuss our project or, or an over in general. Great, thanks very much Felicity. Look, I might um, take the chair's prerogative to ask a couple of questions while others are pondering. Um, and uh, for those of you who would like to ask a question, um, either feel free to pop it into the chat box um, or if you can just raise your hand and I'll, um, yeah, I'll, I'll sort of work through those of you who'd like to ask questions. Felicity, the, the first question I might, I'd be interested to know is just for your reflections on um, sort of the recent labour announcement of community batteries because, you know, in many cases there's been a lot of work over the last few years and obviously now it sort of has been sort of unearthed by, you know, as a sort of as an emerging initiative which might, you know, which we might see deployed um, after the next federal election. Did you have any, any sort of thoughts or reflections on, um, on the actual announcement itself and the implications for sort of what you're doing and, um, you know, for the broader opportunity for community batteries? Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question, Lachlan. I think um, I think one thing that I like to see and, and Anova we like to see is, is federal government uh, policy enabling distributed renewable energy, community energy solutions and also grid scale renewables and storage. And I think there's probably been, um, th those announcements have been few and far between. So seeing more announcements like the community battery announcement to me is a good thing. I think um, what we know and are also seeing with a few other battery projects of this size uh, is that funding is needed to support these projects at this stage to help um, get these projects on the ground. And the other side of that is that there isn't at the moment um, in Osgrid's network anywhere where we're working right now, the network and capacity charges that support assets like community batteries or like large scale batteries themselves. So the capacity charges and network charges that we will need to pay each year over the 10 year life of this project are uh, quite ridiculous and very substantial and impactful to the revenues that we'd like to be generating from this battery that actually, as I've outlined, does actually help Osgrid um, in terms of particularly with the network services agreement we'll put in place, they will have access to call on the stored energy in the battery and they're also putting in a number of their own um, small batteries themselves as well to, to have them, you know, 
ready as, as assets that they can call on if they need to in peak times, but also just to, um, to realise some revenues, I guess, for themselves as well. So having, having policy announcements that are supported by funding and also looking at some of the market conditions to make these projects possible is really, in my view, what we need to, to see happening. Thanks for that. Um, my second question before I'll sort of throw over to others. Um, I was just, uh, I was hoping you might be able to reflect on the, the challenges of being a small retailer. Um, and, you know, just if you had any thoughts on, um, you know, on, on what um, changes regulatory or otherwise, are, you know, are necessary to support um, the entrance of new retailers like Anova into the market. Sure. Look, there's there's a lot of challenges in terms of being a small retailer, and you know, at Anova, we've got a particular challenge because we are um, because so much of our portfolio is solar. So, with 50% of our customer base having rooftop solar, meaning that about 50% of the energy we supply to our customers is coming from our own um, customers' rooftops. The remainder, the other 50%, we buy from the grid. Uh, we have offset all of our energy purchases uh, with national carbon offset certificates for our grid and solar purchases. But um, what that's meant is that we would, you know, we're on a pathway to move to 100% renewable energy that we supply to our customers and we're 50% of the way there. But we actually have not been able to get further than 50% because um, the opportunity to purchase power through power purchase agreements, through long-term energy market contracts uh, from bioenergy or hydro or wind or firmed wind um, have just not been available to us or the price has been um, extremely high for the size um, of the pie that we've been looking to, to procure. Uh, and the, the other side is that there are, have been so many solar farms that have been developed that we would have loved to have signed a an energy contract or a long-term, you know, 10-year power purchase agreement with, and the pricing probably would have been right because there's been so many uh, solar farms developed, but we just haven't been able to take any more solar into our portfolio because of us becoming that net generated during the middle of the day. We need something that complements our load um, rather than adds to our challenge. So for us, we've been um, buying energy from the energy market around um, it's just under $50 um, per megawatt hour more recently. And then we buy energy from our customers about $120 per megawatt hour for the excess solar that they're selling into the grid. It's actually a little bit lower than that, but I'll just kind of use our feed-in tariff number of 12 cents and extrapolate out for now to that 120. So we've, we've been happy um, to support a high feed-in tariff. We led the market in New South Wales with 16 cent feed-in tariff. Um, and that's driven a lot of solar uptake, particularly in the Northern Rivers and, and around, and brought a lot of customers to us to access that high feed-in tariff that we were offering. But it's caused us a lot of challenges on the, on the retail front. Um, there's a lot of regulation in the energy industry, obviously established to ensure that there are customer protections in place for people on life support, low income, hardship, um, and I, I agree with you know, the protections being in place to support um, those types of customers, absolutely. And we have a large proportion of our customer base um, are on concession cards or are low income. We're in a Northern Rivers heartland that whilst there are the Hemsworths of the world up here in our local area, there's also a, a growing divide between, um, between the wealthy and, and low income households that's actually been growing through um, through COVID and there's an increasing homeless um, issue in the area as well. So um, in terms of some of the regulatory areas that can be in place there, we pay the same cost as large retailers, um, but obviously we only have a customer base of 10,000. So um, there can be ways to look at us complying with all of the regulations, but having a tiered approach to some of the compliance costs and, and regulatory costs that we bear that could be staged for a very small retailer, a medium-sized retailer and a large retailer, just to put some cost parity back into, into the equation there. Um, I was at a forum recently talking about the New South Wales government's energy savings scheme and reminiscing about in year one of, of ANOVA's um, business operations, 
the auditing costs were higher than the number of certificates that we needed to buy for that scheme. So there's some there's some things that could be quite easy to to put in place, and others that you know would take um, more thinking. But there's a lot of work being undertaken at the moment by the Energy Security Board for the market redesign for 2025, and a lot of other regulatory changes that are coming that can actually be quite impactful for small retailers and ultimately we're passing those costs back through to businesses and households um, through their energy pricing and we actually don't want to be doing that we want to um, keep costs low and have competitive pricing um, reduce pricing where we can we're probably one of the only retailers that offers free energy coaching uh, to our customers and also some non-customers as well and we offer free energy coaching because we really would like people to understand their energy bills and how they're using their energy in their homes. So we recognise that obviously that, that it's into our revenues, but ultimately we're here for customers. We're community owned, as I mentioned, with our 1,600 individual shareholders, many of those um, who are customers as well. And we want to ensure that we're not um, increasing prices, that we're maintaining our relevance, keeping our pricing competitive, lowering pricing where we can, but also continuing to adapt and innovate and bring in new products and services um, like our peer-to-peer -peer trading, um, you know, like um, electric vehicle bulk buys and electric vehicle tariffs to incentivise people to charge at different times of the day and night um, and other smart technologies that will really empower people and make, make life um, easy. And I think sometimes in the, in the regulatory discussions, um, you know, we all need to remember at the end of the day, it's households and businesses that are one paying for all of this, including all of us on, on the Zoom conference that, that live in homes and work in businesses. Um, and the complexity that's coming um, through the pipeline is, is quite intense. And, and even peer-to-peer -peer trading, we need to be really careful about the language that we use and how we describe that and what it actually means and what it will do, um, because it's not an easy concept for people to to understand so for us it's about demystifying that's why our energy coaches are, are really important as well but yes there's you know in terms of being a small retailer there are i guess a small retailer that is wanting to disrupt the market by bringing in innovative renewable energy and storage solutions for customers there's um our solar gardens probably a good example of about a three-year journey to um, to bring in a solar garden and part of that was getting an ATO uh, Australian Taxation Office um, tax ruling on the credit that was applied to customers bills. The solar gardens are a unique way to provide uh, renewable energy to households that just couldn't afford um, a solar system themselves and so we install solar on a business rooftop. Um, they pay for that solar energy at a 30% discount and then we pass the money that they pay us to community groups and low-income households, um, either on their own overbills or through their housing provider um, rental agreements so that they end up with credits um, on their rent or credits on their energy bill that reduces the cost of their energy and gives them access to, um, to renewable energy in a really unique way. We've seen a lot of solar gardens overseas and, um, and one so far, our and over one in uh, in New South Wales, and I think we're the first still in Australia. There's a very large project, Haystacks, looking to get off the ground at the moment, a 1.5 megawatt solar farm. Um, ours was the first uh, behind the metre solar garden, and Haystacks will be the first um, in front of the metre solar farm, solar garden, um, providing 330 households with access to renewables through that solar garden. So sometimes it's the, you know, the, the tax office that, you know, you wouldn't necessarily think in, in the energy context that you'd be dealing with the tax office, but um, we were successful in getting a tax ruling um, that enabled us to, to not have um, a tax or GST charged as part of that, that credit that is applied to household bills. Haystacks um, is still working through with the ATO to, um, to have a favourable tax ruling as well and hopefully um, they will receive that. We've provided our information to them to, to help them with that application. But yes, there, there are um, many examples of, um, of small retailers um, sometimes not being able to catch a break to just get through to the next level um, and next size to, to operate in the market. 
Well, we certainly wish you well in growing from here. Thank you. I'm going to jump across to some questions on the chat. Um, first question's um, really a technical one um, around the uh, battery capacity. So um, the question is just, um, is the battery capacity over five megawatts? Um, and uh, sort of then specific questions around um, whether or not you have to be over five megawatts to participate in FCAS um, and whether you can participate in FCAS being connected to the distribution network. Thanks for, for that question. Uh, so the battery is, is around one megawatts or two megawatt hours and uh, to participate in the FCAS markets, you need to be over one megawatt. So we meet that requirement uh, just. So yes, we will be able to operate um, in, in the FCAS markets. We've been working with a consultant too, who I didn't mention a group called ITP Renewables, who also have quite a lot of experience in um, large scale battery uh, connections and installations in the process. So it's been really important for us. We're a very small team of 30, mostly focused on energy retailing, customer service sales, um, marketing, finance operations, etc. So it's been really critical for us to have um, great advice through a consultant to help advise us on this project as well. Great. Um, I might throw across to, uh, to Tom. Tom, do you, want to, do you want to ask your question in person? Um, yes. Um, greetings from the O'Connor Cafe here. Um, <laughs> is there a role for um, vehicle to grid in this? Um, with user behaviour, which was discussed at a previous one of these seminars, um, can we expect the average person to be able to work out when to plug their car in that they'll get the benefit of charging off peak, contributing to the local area on peak? Or is it just a bit too hard? It's a good question, Tom, and um, great to hear in a cafe. <laughs> great backdrop you've got there. Um, there, look, there definitely is a role. The, there's, there's a lot of um, retailers, including us, looking at uh, electric vehicles and um, there's obviously you know, the ability for EVs to be charged um, by being plugged in at home or in a business at the moment and there isn't quite um, the ability for that stored energy in the vehicle to be sent back to the grid. Uh, at the moment, but that may come in the future. I think the interesting thing is that um, that we're exploring is someone being able to come home at, let's say, 6.30 at night, plug in their car at home, um, but for that car to not actually start charging um, and drawing energy from their home till midnight, for instance. And then for us as the retailer to set a, a tariff that, you know, potentially um, is, is more favourable from, from midnight onwards, um, to encourage and drive that behaviour as well. So we need two kind of two things need to happen in that scenario. One is there needs the infrastructure, um, the charging infrastructure needs to have the capacity to time shift um, and enable someone to have that you know benefit of just being able to plug in. We, we don't want to expect um, and rely on behaviour um, or behaviour change. I guess it's, it won't be behaviour change necessarily with EVs because it will just be um, new behaviours that we're wanting to encourage. But we want to make things easy for people and we don't want someone to come home at 6.30 and then think, oh, it's midnight, I've got to plug in my car now, it's time to start charging. So that kind of time shift of ability in EVs is, is a critical piece in terms of the infrastructure. But then similarly for retailers having um, EV worthy offers that are um, you know, acceptable and um, beneficial to households. Um, in terms of the hours that you would be charging and recognising lower um, lower power. So for us at ANOVA, um, it's obviously going to be quite important for us to incentivise where we can some daytime um, charging of electric vehicles for retirees or people who are working from home or just home during the day um, to charge up during the day rather than at night time or in an evening. So we can bring in a tariff structure to, to incentivise um, for that as well. Obviously, we're quite unique. Most retailers have about a third of their customer base with solar. And, and as I mentioned, we've got 50% of our customer base. So we're, um, we did have close to 60, but it's just um, we've moved into Queensland and started to bring on more customers without solar, um, more apartment dwellers. Um, so it's changed our mix slightly. 
Great. Thanks, Felicity. I'd also just, um, for those of you who haven't seen it in the chat, Tom posted an article and he's attempting to popularise yet another acronym in the energy space, the U to G. So we'll see if that takes off. Um, uh, there was a question from, uh, from Chloe. Chloe, I don't know if you're still on the call, but if so, would you like to ask your question? Ah, still on the call, but sadly on a bus. Um, so perhaps I will, uh, I can, I'll ask the question for you. Um, Felicity, sort of in regards to the just transition, how do we work to prioritise distributing batteries to vulnerable communities and households to ensure that in, um, in times of extreme weather and peak times, um, vulnerable households are not disproportionately affected by increased prices and reduced reliability? Great question, Chloe, and um, thanks, Lachlan. We see that as a really critical part of our work. It's, it's Enova's remit, as I mentioned, to ensure that we're not leaving people behind in the transition to renewable energy. And, and batteries and community batteries can play a significant role in this. So as I mentioned, we'll be looking to provide some of the stored energy in the battery to low-income households and charities, either as free power or um, significantly reduced cost power so that we are sharing the benefits more directly with low-income households and, um, and not-for-profits. Um, it's becoming a, a more critical issue in terms of the, the divide, um, as I also mentioned, in terms of low-income households um, and people that, that might have been able to afford a solar system or had been saving up for rooftop um, solar PV or, um, or a battery if they already have PV. Um, have been more impacted through COVID and also floods and storms that we've seen recently. So with, um, with job impacts and weather events and storms, floods, um, some of the money that people may have saved um, is now going to be you know, directly used by um, keeping families together and ensuring that they can put food on the table. So we are still seeing obviously a lot of, of solar um, and battery storage in individual um, household situations going in. But it is something that organisations like PIAC, the Public um, Interest and Advoc Advocacy Council, um, the Energy, um, Energy Services Commission, um, organisations like ANOVA and other social enter enterprises are really uh, watching and ensuring that you know, a lot of what we bring out is specifically designed to provide access um, to low-income households, like our solar gardens that I mentioned, they're specifically designed for people that um, are locked out of being able to own rooftop solar. So we know 30% of renters are not able to put rooftop solar on their roof. Um, other people have shading issues or you know, they're in ground floor apartments, for instance, they're just not able to access a roof space or it's controlled by, by a landlord and not within their direct control. So they're... There is, in my view, not enough work going on in this space. There's a lot of community energy groups um, that, that have this as a consideration in terms of ensuring vulnerable community members will have access uh, to renewables and storage um, and also understanding any new technology that, that does come out. And that's why even with our peer-to-peer -peer, um, messaging and peer-to-peer -peer project that is part of the battery project, the Beehive project, we need to really look at who we're bringing into that project and ensure that one, it's delivering benefits and two, that it's easy to understand how those benefits will be realised um, rather than just bringing something in that's complex and complicated and um, takes four conversations to explain. That's not really where we want to be. Um, it is part of bringing in new technology and new services and solutions. There is always that education piece as well. Um, we've been the front runners in, in some of that with solar gardens and microgrids um, and obviously with our community battery project as well. But we're looking forward to a time when, um, as I said, there are community batteries everywhere and people have more technology choices in their, in their fingertips through their phone um, and their, the ability to ensure that they're able to manage and control and understand their costs. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, I think sticking on the sort of on the theme of, um, you know, customers and making sure the customers are getting what they, um, you know, want out of the energy transition, um, I might throw across to Hedda. Did you want to um, ask the question, Hedda? 
Hi, thank you. Can you can you see me? We can. Yes. And we can hear you. Hi, Felicity. Thanks so much for taking the time to share um, share this this work. Um, I actually have a sneaky extra question. Um, the first one is around language, and we've had sort of ongoing conversations within our program about about this term community battery. I think we've had sort of three or four different um, different terms. Um, everything from neighborhood scale, community scale, local um, batteries. Um, and it's, it's, it's an interesting one that's sort of come up in the context of speaking with, with a whole range of people, some of who work in community energy, who sort of make this point, or well, community energy has, a, has, a, has an existing definition. Um, and if say you have a network um, that owns and operates um, the battery, you know, for their own, for their own um, for their own purposes, then that's not sort of community energy under that existing definition. So just curious to hear your thoughts on, on language um, around this particular um, scale of battery. Um, so that was my first um, question. And then this other one, um, which is sort of around, you've touched a, on a sort of bunch of different examples of the ways that you engage with your customers and I suppose a consistent Theme that we hear from our research is that part of the distrust in the energy system is linked to people feeling like the energy system is not delivering um, on their kind of needs and expectations of what, what they want from technology and, and the system um, more broadly. Um, so just curious to hear a bit more around um, the different I guess it's an opportunity to even maybe um, expand on the, the energy coaching that you mentioned. Be very curious to hear more about the different kind of engagement strategies you have in place um, and your experiences of them um, and how they influence, you know, key decisions about how you, um, how you run, run, run the business. Yeah, great. Thanks for those uh, questions, Heather. Great questions. In terms of community, community batteries, community energy batteries and, and that definition there, um, I, I do agree if it's a community battery that a retailer puts in or a network puts in or an, another group um, puts in as, a, as an asset connected to a network that is only delivering benefits back to them um, and is increasing their revenues and, and profits, then in my view, it's not a community uh, battery. Um, if it's a community battery that is delivering uh, benefits back to community members, um, and I guess the way that we're doing that is through the peer-to-peer -peer trading and having the battery itself participate um, as a node in that peer-to-peer -peer trading um, platform. People will be able to buy some of the stored energy in the battery as well as buy from one of their neighbours or the other participants in the, um, on the energy um, power tracer and OCS platform. Um, the, other, the other side of that in terms of you know, community batteries is, is looking at the, the, those long-term benefits. So as I said, if, if they're not, if those benefits are just going back into that individual organisation, in my view, that's not community energy. But if there's ways that the revenues are flowing directly back, um, like with ours through the peer-to-peer -peer trading, where we'll also allocate some of the battery energy to um, not-for-profits and low-income households directly um, through that cheaper power or free power. But we're also aiming to pass the savings back through um, to our full customer base. So we're not looking at this as, great, we can just increase our profit margin, uh, which is very slim anyway. Uh, we're looking at, let's get some, um, you know, let's increase our revenues, look at um, how we can bring those savings back to our customers through more competitive or cheaper pricing overall. So I think it's in terms of how, how the batteries are being used. And I know that some of the batteries will have specific geographical um, relevance to communities. Ours, I guess, is situated in Curry Curry and will have benefit to the Curry Curry community if we have Anova customers um, that are coming onto the peer-to-peer -peer trial or just coming over to Anova and are in Curry Curry, then we'll be able to get benefits back to them. Um, with our structure as well of, of having 50% of our 
profits going from our retail arm into our not-for-profit arm for community renewable energy projects, we've also got the ability to specifically target, for instance, Curry Curry, and look at funding um, through a grants project, other community energy um, projects in that area as well. So I think we will hear more about community batteries and, um, and in some ways, some of those will just be a battery at the end of the street that the residents in that street might not be actually getting the benefit from a network, for instance, might be using that stored energy at those peak times um, and having it as a bit of a, a stopgap to, to fill um, some of those peak demand surges and challenges that, that networks and the grid has. So I think we'll hear the name bandied around more than we'll see community battery projects. That that's my view at the moment. I'd love to be love to be wrong on that front, but I think that's that's the sense that I'm getting right now. Um, in terms of you know the energy industry not necessarily delivering for um, I think that was around for vulnerable um, community members. Um, that that in my view is is part of a, a wider social issue beyond just energy. It's in terms of access to affordable housing, um, you know, regenerative agriculture and access to organic or um, wholesome foods. And one of the things that we do at ANOVA is when we have new customers uh, signing up with us, they can choose to have at the moment a $75 credit on their first bill, or they can choose for us to provide it to one of our charity partners. And at the moment in New South Wales, our charity partner is a group called Children's Ground that have a lot of um, education and empowerment programs for local Indigenous children. And in Queensland, we're working with a group called Community Living Association, and um, they provide people with cognitive disabilities uh, with work um, and employment opportunities and have set up local cafes to, to employ people and they manage some of the local parks as well. So we've actually managed to provide over $80,000 in the last 18 months to organisations a bit similar to Oz Harvest. There's one here called Liberation Larder in Byron Bay that makes 28,000 meals each year for people in need. Um, and to the Red Cross and Blaze Aid to support families impacted by the bushfires. Um, to the Black Dog Institute to support farmers that have been in a mental health crisis through um, extended periods of drought. So for us at ANOVA, we don't just see energy as, as an issue for vulnerable people. We see it as um, a growing social issue. And here in the Northern Rivers at the moment, we're experiencing a lot of homeless, um, homelessness and a lot of um, targeting of, of um, single parents, particularly who are not able to find accommodation for, um, for them and their children. We're seeing a growing number of people living in their cars and vans and turning up to access local, local services. Um, I was pleased through COVID to see the, I think this was the New South Wales government expanded their EPA, their energy um, assistance program vouchers from I think it was $300 um, that you could access twice a year to um, $500 twice a year. So a total of $1,000 to help, um, help with your bills. The interesting thing about accessing that money though, is that you need to, I think have missed payments on three bills. So if you're just on the cusp of hardship and not being able to pay your bills, it's almost encouraging you to get into some worse behaviour around just stop paying them to then access that funding. So again, we're very grateful that the New South Wales government and the other um, state um, and territory governments have similar schemes, has that money available to support people in need. But the way to access it could actually be slightly easier in terms of if a retailer is um, working with householders and assessing them and realising that they are in hardship now, but they've been managing to pay their bills but won't be able to. Um, we find that retailers, um, retail bills and rent and mortgages are usually the first bills to be paid when people are struggling um, or the other bills start to, to drop off. But we do have a growing number of people in hardship and on payment plans um, that we're happy to, to support. Um, and there is that access to, to government funding there. We'd like to see that stay at the current level that it's at, perhaps with some easier ways to access it. Um, just when COVID hit, the way to access that funding was to go into um, approved organisations like St Vincent de Paul or local community centres to, to um, seek approval and to access that money. Obviously, when COVID hit, everyone closed their doors quite literally 
and people could not go into organisations to, to, to access those payments and the, the government and organisations needed to move very quickly to look at phone services to do phone assessments and provide, um, provide that money over the phone. So we have seen business and government um, able to pivot, particularly through COVID, um, to, to assist. Uh, households, but there's still definitely more that can be done. And, you know, it's one of the reasons that, that Inosal was happy to set up in a heartland where there is a lot of low income households. Um, because if we can, we can have a viable model here where we can provide competitive renewable energy um, to households, increase resilience and sustainability in communities, then it's got to be a model that can be rolled out um, across the country. Thanks, Felicity. I think that might be a very nice positive note to end um, the, uh, the webinar on today. I'm sorry, there are still a couple of questions that have remained unanswered, but uh, at, uh, to avoid me getting in trouble for running over time, I'll call a close to it there. Um, Felicity, thanks so much um, for presenting today um, and for being so willing to talk about um, the work that you are doing. And as I said, we wish you well, um, obviously, uh, as you continue to grow and with the specific projects you were talking about today. Uh, to everybody else who was able to join and listen in, thank you and thank you very much for the great questions. Um, I hope you all have a great afternoon and um, look forward to seeing you here again in a couple of weeks. Thanks very much, Lachlan. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Felicity. Bye, Bye for now.